Hello and welcome to Ropescast, the independent voice of the Middle East. I'm Ibrahim Abu Ahmad. And I'm Ksenia Svetlova. Rope stands for the Regional Organization for Peace, Economics and Security. We are a young organization that works to lay the groundwork for a post-conflict Middle East by connecting forward-thinking Israeli, Palestinian and Middle Eastern leaders all across the region. We share a holistic vision for the Middle East where everyone has more to win from the conflict, resolution and integration than to lose. If you are looking for more information on ROPES, please visit our website, ropes.org. Our very special guest today is Nidal Fukaha, a Director General of the Palestinian Peace Coalition, Geneva Initiative in Ramallah. He is the head of the Palestinian-Israeli Peace and Geo Forum's political commission, as well as the deputy chairman and founder of Freedom Forum Palestine, an NGO that promotes civil liberties in Palestine. Hello, Nidal, and welcome to the Ropescast. Hello, Brahim. Hello, Xenia. Thank you very much, Nidal, for joining us. Uh, and I immediately have a small confession to make. Uh, me and Nidal, we know each other for many years. I think maybe not less than 17, 18 years. And Gidal, you remember, I used to interview you in Ramallah, uh, still during the days of the Second Intifada. And we discussed the possibilities of possibility of resuming of peace negotiations and post-Intifada rebuilding of Gaza and West Bank. And here we are today in the middle of yet another war in Gaza. And we again discuss the possibilities of the post-war and the day after. How do you feel about this? How, you well, know... Peacemaker going like this in circles. Uh, Oksenia, you reminded me actually with the the first days of, of our relation. I will you know, uh, and I hope uh, that such a relation will be the model for the relationship between Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, definitely, the fact that you know two uh, individuals on the two sides of the divide can maintain such a sustainable relationship for more than 17 years means automatically that peace is possible. And uh, what we only miss actually, the will of the political leaders. And I would like to ask you uh, if we're talking about, you know, uh, the people themselves. Uh, We're seeing what's happening uh, in Gaza, of course. But my question is uh, more about the current situation in the West Bank. Because we saw uh, some of the latest polls that indicate that Hamas is becoming even more and more popular in the West Bank. Now, of course, these are wartime polls, but still, how do you explain this phenomenon, this support, uh, increased support for Hamas in the West Bank? Yeah, I myself, uh, I have a different uh, say when it comes actually to judging the popularity of Hamas or the popularity of the PLO factions in the West Bank on uh, the background of such a severe and bloody war on the Gaza Strip. I believe that this is that this is not the real popularity of both sides. Nowadays, the question is, the question is not on, not on, or the answer is not on whether you are uh, with Hamas or not with Hamas, but it is whether you are against this war and against the killing of Palestinians. And you know, this assumption that Hamas is the one who is trying to fight Israel because Israel is attacking the Gaza Strip. So uh, testing or checking the popularity of the different political groups during the time of war, when there is a group which is fighting and the other group which is still fully committed to the peace track, and to the, uh, you know, this Oslo uh, path, then definitely you will end up with such results, but such results do not reflect the reality. Such results are not sustainable at all. And I firmly believe any public opinion poll in a month after the, uh, the day after the day after, definitely the results will be completely different because definitely then people will uh, look around themselves. They will see uh, whoever is doing, uh, you know, uh, the right thing or not the right thing. But at the end of the day, you know, this has nothing to do with the 
normal popularity of Hamas. Hamas has its own constituency and support, and others have their own. And this much better to be checked and tested after the war, but not during the war. Well, yes, you know, of course, that uh, all of the wartime polling is, uh, of course, uh, not very reliable. Uh, it expresses the immediate emotions uh, in the midst of the war uh, and so on, you know. But still, you know, I think, Nidal, when we are looking back at the last year, and the last year was, ex- ex- you know, extremely uh, turbulent and violent, and uh, there were many clashes in the West Bank, uh, less so in Gaza, uh, then we saw already there was this tendency for support of the armed struggle, uh, probably because every other option uh, failed. Uh, what do you think about it? You know, there was this popularity of the Lion Den, if you recall, about a year ago. Uh, yeah. And then also Hamas got, a, you know, like more support, not like now, but still, you know, more than before. Uh, what do you think about it? Well, you see, you said that... Uh... Uh, Oxelia, it's a matter. It's a matter of options. You know, the nature do not accept a uh, vacuum, and the fact that you know the Middle East peace process did not lead, you know, to the ultimate goal uh, of having uh, for the Palestinians their own independent state. This means, you know, this process is failing or already failed, and as a result, you know, others will provide certain uh, alternatives, and automatically, you know, people. Will not will not opt for uh, the option which is already uh, not making a progress or a failure option, which is the peace uh, uh, track. As as a result, people tended during the last year or even during the last few years because of uh, the consecutive series of failures of the Middle East peace process to be more to the other side. Let's not forget that the reality on the ground for the Palestinians in the West Bank is too hard. Nowadays, we should judge the behavior and the position of the Palestinians on the background of what they are Mm -hmm. daily suffering when it comes to the settler violence and even terrorism. Now, there are acts of terror which are being launched against Palestinians in the West Bank. And as a result, the reaction of the Palestinians is to be more affiliated or supportive for uh, the resistant groups and not for the other groups which do not do anything when it comes to the settlers and settlers' violence. And uh, speaking of the settler violence and what's happening in the West Bank, you know, while uh, we're seeing uh, Gaza right now in ruins, do you expect or do you see a possibility that uh, we'll have a new front in the West Bank? Uh, Are we on the verge of another intifada, perhaps? What do you think about uh, any escalation on that front? You know, the one one who uh, increases the escalation and the one who stands behind the escalation here in the West Bank is Israel and the Israeli settlers, but not the Palestinians. If you just uh, trace the different development, mainly the security developments on the ground, all the attacks have been made against Palestinians in Jenin, in Tubas, in Nablus, and in Tul Karim, but not on the other side of the border. I myself, I do not expect and I don't I do not see any signals actually of a Palestinian Intifada now. But this doesn't mean that a new Intifada or a new uh, stronger round of violence is not expected. Everything, everything is dependent on the behavior of the Israeli government. And if the Israeli government will continue allowing the settlers to use the arm against the Palestinians and to turn the Palestinians' lives into hell and to allow their army to keep and continue storming all Palestinian communities in the West Bank, this might lead definitely to a new level of violence. But There is no Palestinian actually here in the West Bank or wherever who wants to see actually uh, the damage and the destruction which do exist in the Gaza Strip here in the West Bank. But also that doesn't mean that Palestinians here in the West Bank, including the PLO or the different components of the constituency are not 
seeking and uh, making their effort to pursue their uh, freedom and having an independent Palestinian state. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you, Nidal, about, uh, you know, so we see the incursions right now in Jenin, in Tubas, Tulkaram especially, uh, and uh, other cities where, you know, there are tunnels as well, and uh, there are uh, this... Uh, uh, organized uh, groups of, uh, you know, Hamas uh, uh, people and uh, Islamic Jihad and also others. Uh, and uh, there is a real fighting. You know, sometimes you see footage and you don't understand whether it's from Gaza or from other place. Do you think that we are today, we are standing on the brink of a war? Frank, I will, you know, bluntly uh, ask it. Uh, do you think that we are on the brink of another intipada in Gaza? Yeah, I believe, I believe the Palestinians are practicing a high level of self uh, restrain when it comes to their reaction to the Israeli army uh, activities in the West Bank. Uh, you know, uh, so far, more than 300 Palestinians have been killed since uh, the start of the war on Gaza, since October 7. This is very high number. You know, if this number of uh, killings among the Palestinian, Palestinians took place during a different timing, it will be a direct reason, actually, and cause for a more Palestinian intifada or even, you know, a higher, much more higher level of attacks on Israelis. But what we see, what we see today, we do not see on daily basis attacks on Israelis. What we see is a daily attacks on Palestinians, either by the Israeli army or by the Israeli settlers. The way the Israeli army is dealing with the Palestinians in the West Bank. It is as if the army is in a battlefield, actually. You know, the rules of engagement, the way they kill Palestinians, the vast majority of them are civilians, including children. If you just return back to the documentation of the killing of two Palestinians in Al Farah refugee camp last week, uh, which is, you know, part of my uh, home place, uh, Tubas, if you just look to those who have been killed also recently on Tul Karim. It is an execution by the Israeli. The Israeli army could easily actually avoid killing them because there were no need. Definitely, it's always there is no need to kill people. But the main the main problem nowadays it is the Israeli attacks on the Palestinians in the West Bank, and it it is the one which we which may lead to more escalation or a new intifada. But the Palestinians, definitely, they do not have the intention. They do not have the plan to go for a new intifada for the time being, simply because the Palestinians are also concerned from the Israeli intentions of evacuating certain communities in the West Bank. You know, uh, the Palestinians are really uh, considering seriously the issue of forced displacement by the Israeli authorities when it comes to certain uh, Palestinian communities in the south, for instance, south of the West Bank or certain uh, areas uh, behind the wall. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nidal, uh, before the uh, horrific events of 10-7, the massacre and then the war in Gaza, we hosted Dr. Dalia Shindlin and Dr. Khalil Shkaki, uh, in here in Rope's cast, and we discussed the Oslo Accords 30 years after they were concluded. The temporary became constant, and what was supposed to last five years turned into 30 somehow. Uh, how do we make sure that this stalemate will end? Do you see a chance for a breakthrough now specifically? Uh, because, uh, you know, we are so shaken uh, about everything that happened, and uh, you see what is going on in Gaza. Uh, do you see also opportunity in this change? You know what? Uh, I believe I believe this uh, high number of killings, of uh, massacres, will not take us to a completely different uh, era and a different chapter when it comes to the relationship of Palestinians and Israelis. Definitely, nothing will create the change. Uh, nowadays, there is a new spirit, and for the first time. Uh, given the last the last decades when it comes to the Palestinian-Israeli issue and the Middle East peace process, uh, this issue 
for the first time returned to be on the top of the international diplomatic agenda. There is a momentum and it's whether we take this momentum a step forward to turn it into a program that leads to an independent Palestinian state or we choose to continue in this conflict which means unfortunately we will see more of what we already saw during the last few uh, months. This means, you know, both Palestinians and Israelis will pay a more or a heavier prices also in the future. It's either or. We have the chance today. We have the chance today. Either we turn it into a real program or miss this chance as we did in several occasions in the past. And as you say, you know, um, that we need to look at you know, so and it's something that's been discussed in a lot of conferences already and some of the things that we've been uh, you know participating in talking a lot about the day so called the day after uh, or the next day after the war in Gaza and you know the west bank is hardly uh, ever mentioned in that regard can can even gaza be fixed alone without the general reference to the palestinian issue and without uh, and you know focusing on the situation in the west bank as well or do we have to have a, a holistic view and a vision for the entire palestinian case uh, you know the only the only approach which will work actually is a holistic approach that takes into consideration both the west bank and the gaza strip uh, a political a political context which tackles both the needs and the rights of the Palestinians in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip is the only approach which can work at, and which can be sustainable for the future. Nowadays, you know, there are several conversations on the day after. Mm -hmm. uh, several uh, parties, when it comes to the international community, they are talking about the day after. Israel is talking about the day after. I believe, you know, no successful proposal for the day after will see the light unless the whole Palestinian territories are taken into consideration within a comprehensive political framework, a framework that leads to an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as capital living side by side with Israel. This is the way, this is the way forward, you know. Israel has try, tried to deal with Gaza over the last 15 years separately. And Israel, in a way or another, you know, tried to deepen this split between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And this is the result. This is the result. Israel, you know, uh, did, did, did not also uh, allow the success of the Middle East peace process or did not allow, you know, the light or did not allow the Palestinians to uh, progress toward an, an independent state. And now we see a similar conversation. Uh, now there is this confusion or mix between the internal Israeli political agenda and what's being done now in the Gaza Strip. And the conversation which focuses on who can prevent or allow a future independent Palestinian state. This is a serious but dangerous conversation and this should stop. And I believe, you know, there should be reasonable and rational voices in Israel and they should raise the red card and say enough is enough. Preventing the Palestinian state will not bring peace to the Israelis. To the contrary, the only way, the only way for a sustainable peace is an independent Palestinian state. So, you know, in Italy, that uh, for us in ropes, uh, you know, uh, we are uh, firm believers uh, in uh, the idea of the two state solution. Uh, it was actually the organization uh, was created uh, uh, with the organizing idea of the Arab Peace Initiative uh, before the Abraham Accords. Uh, but since we are a regional organization, we also believe that uh, in the future process of uh, revival of negotiations and, uh, you know, hopefully the solution uh, for this uh, long-term conflict, uh, there should be a role for the Arab countries, for the neighborhood, I would say, yes. 
And uh, today there is a lot of uh, discussion about what should be the role uh, of uh, the Arab countries. Everybody builds on them to foot the bill of the post-war rebuilding of Gaza on certain conditions, of course, and so on. Um, and I you know, ask, want to ask you, uh, what do you think the region can also bring to the table? I mean, if there is a structure that uh, you mentioned right now, yes, which I you know, think that Israel can only gain from this and not lose, um, if there is uh, this kind of political horizons. And we do have the involvement of Arab partners uh, that already have normal relations with Israel and others who have semi-normal relations with Israel. Um, do you think that you know, uh, there is something else apart for just money. I mean, you know, can they help, uh, you know, like rebuild right now economy, uh, integrate more Israelis and Palestinians uh, into some, you know, common project? You know, how do you feel about the involvement in general? And uh, what do you see as a, a channel uh, for, you know, for them to benefit also with themselves, with the region, with Israelis and with Palestinians? I myself, I believe uh, the regional role became uh, even during the last few months, more relevant and much more needed, actually. Uh, the, <clears throat> the context of the war uh, highlighted the need of a regional role, mainly uh, with, with the both sides, because now we have several regional players who enjoy uh, normal relationships with both sides of the conflict. Now, in the past, in the past, you know, Israel used to look at the regional players as, you know, the one who completely adopts the Palestinian agenda. But now Israel is enjoying some good relations with some Arab countries. But those Arab countries, uh, for them, the Palestinian agenda is still on the top of their list. And their effort, actually, which has been made clear through the ministerial committee established by the Arab and Islamic uh, summit in uh, Riyadh and its effort and its advocacy role which has been made in uh, China and Europe in the United States and within the UN uh, is by itself a good example of what the Arab country can do and the regional players uh, can uh, present. When it comes to the day after I believe also they can have a very significant role, both political and financial. And once again, we don't need those regional players to be only payers, but to be to be players. And I believe they can contribute to a certain arrangement backing one and sole Palestinian representation for both the Gaza Strip and for the West Bank. And I believe the Arab countries, given that there are some Arab countries who enjoy excellent relationship with Hamas, others enjoy excellent relationship with Israel, but even both who enjoy the excellent relationship with, Ham uh, with sorry, with the PA, both who enjoy the excellent relationship with the PA and with Hamas, they have good relations with Israel and they can play a significant role. Let's not forget that on October 7, you know, there were an active Arab-Israeli peace track, the Saudi-Israeli uh, normalization efforts. I myself, I believe, you know, this effort will not be completely frozen or uh, put on hold forever. Once there will be a return, actually, to this effort, I believe it must include a strong Palestinian dimension. And it's the time now, it's the time now for Israel to know, as well as for the Arabs to know, that the window to the Arab and the Islamic world should be Ramallah. So Ramallah should not be ignored. The Palestinian, the Palestinian dimension should not be ignored. It's Israel who should understand first that no normalization agreement will bring peace. You know, the experience of the last few years uh taught us this lesson this is the lesson learned whatever you do if if there is no peace agreement with the palestinians there will not be be a peace here nor security nor stability so from from this perspective and within this framework i believe the regional countries within the international frame 
I believe they can play a very active political uh, and even financial role. I agree with you completely. I just want to add that, uh, you know, this is our model uh, in ROPES. And we are proud that uh, we have today uh, over 100 uh, alumni that uh, of our various programs in education, uh, media, peace building, activism, and so on, that are coming from both the Palestinian Autonomy, Gaza and West Bank, and also the Palestinian diaspora, Israelis, of course, and the American Jews, uh, and also regional uh, representatives from 10 different Arab countries uh, across the region. Some of them are from Abraham Accords, others are veteran uh, partners for peace, uh, such as Egypt and Jordan, uh, and also some countries that for now, um, you know, there is still no diplomatic relations, but hopefully if there will be a progress, uh, then there will be also some kind of agreement with them. Ibrahim, you had a question for yes. Dan. Uh, and it actually follows on what you just said, Ksenia, because we have these amazing young people who are advocating for peace, and uh, you stated, Nadal, you know, about the, the fact that the, the Arab countries do have in the top of their priority the Palestinian issue a, a, as a top priority. But still, within the Arab street in the, in the MENA region, we see uh, we don't see a, a huge support for the Abraham Accords, definitely not when it was signed. And unfortunately, now with the war going on, we see, uh, for instance, with the Houthi uh, inter the Houthi, Yemeni Houthi intervention and the rockets that they launched, that they received a lot of support. How can we change that? How can we combat this perception that only uh, violent radical uh, movements that go against Israel are the ones that will get support from the Arab world on the public sphere and particularly among the young? You know, I believe we should not uh, sell ourselves or sell others. Any any illusion, any illusion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, Israel Israel uh, tried to convince itself and to convince the Israelis that now everything is fine with the uh, Abrahamic Accords. Now you know the the way the way is open. Uh, you Israelis will be welcomed everywhere. The truth is not. Is not this. The truth is, as far as there is no peace with the Palestinians, there is no way or there is no door which is open for the Israelis in the Middle East. This is the truth, frankly speaking, even much more beyond the Middle East. Now we see also the gap and the difference in the positions between the public and the governments in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we see that Hundreds so of thousands group. of Europeans are showing up to the streets, for instance, in the UK and some other places against the war and in support of Palestinians back to the regional to the regional issue. Uh, if there is no sustainable and final peace deal with the Palestinians and normal relation with the Palestinians, then definitely, definitely any round of violence will be immediately echoed and directly affecting any bilateral Israeli-Arab relationship. And this is how is it now in Jordan, in Egypt, in the Gulf, and in Northern Africa. So the only way for the relationship to be really normal, this reminds me actually to the pillars and uh, the main the main principles which are adopted also by ROPS, which is the Arab Peace Initiative. You know, imagine, imagine for a moment if those Abrahamic Accords have been signed within the context of the Arab Peace Initiative and the Palestinian issue is already closed. Definitely, you know, what we are witnessing today, we will not witness, we will not see in the streets. So, we know actually, we know the obstacles, we know the challenges, we know that there are still so many difficulties and turbulences on the way to the Arab uh, street. And despite that, we are trying to take this path and convince ourselves that the relationship will be normal. No, it will not be normal. As far as there is a war on Gaza, and as far as there is this settler terrorism and violence against the Palestinians and three, more than 300 Palestinians have been killed, 
definitely uh, there will be more more voices or at least visible voices against israel uh, given this reality well, Nidal, I just hope that, uh, you know, uh, next time we speak in uh, 17 years and hopefully even 10 years or five years, even better, though, we'll discuss not another war, but we will discuss the thriving uh, peace agreement uh, and the real change of the reality that our nations need so badly. Uh, let's be optimistic. Months, Oxenia, months, not years. <laughs> <laughs> You're even more optimistic than me. <laughs> uh, we need to have you more often to give us this optimism, yes. honestly. Yes. We, we we hope so. Uh, if you, fin you finish the conversation. I would just want to thank you so very much, uh, you know, and uh, we'll be very happy to host you time and again, also to meet with our delegates. Uh, thank you for very much that you do. Uh, that was uh, Nidal Kupaha. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Shukran. Okay. Thank you so much, Yuxinia and Ibrahim. It's my pleasure. My best wishes to you. Uh, we are approaching the... Uh, Christmas and the New Year. Uh, I I hope you know uh, it will be always uh, a year for peace and the prosperity, but not war. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Ropescast, the independent voice of the Middle East. Our guest today was Manar Ash Sharif. We hope you enjoyed the Ropescast. Our podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all quality podcast platforms. We are very grateful to all our listeners from the Middle East, Europe, the US, and other parts of the world. You can support our work by small donation. More details on our websites, ropes.org. We also invite you to follow ropes.org on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Thread to learn more about our work with the emerging leaders of the Middle East. I'm Ibrahim Abu Ahmad. And I'm Ksenia Svetlova. Shalom. And salam.